Good afternoon, it's Tuesday the 24th of November, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, uh, and I'm joined today uh, via Skype by Alex Thompson from Eastern Approaches. Now, the news, the main news of the day, uh, just as a result of its seriousness, um, is the uh, shooting down of the Russian Su-24 aircraft. Two pilots on board. Uh, initial images showed two parachutes uh, coming out of that aircraft and uh, well, it took a long time for, uh, for any kind of confirmation about the status of these, the welfare of these two pilots. It now sounds as if they're both dead. Um, and uh, well, to, so far at least, uh, the Russians being pretty cautious about things, um, they are saying it was a very serious incident. Uh, they were asked uh, whether Russia would invoke its right to self-defense, um, as, uh, as the UN Charter suggests. Uh, and they have said that until there are clarifying reports, it's impossible to answer this question. Uh, and this is, uh, this is Dmitry Peskov, Putin's spokesman. And he said, so far the Ministry of Defense has not, uh, the Defense Ministry has not yet confirmed what brought our warplane down. We know as a fact that the aircraft was in Syrian airspace above Syrian territory. And this is a point that they have been making very clearly. Uh, the Turkish government hasn't claimed that they shot the aircraft down. Um, and so we wait to see what the repercussions of that. It's been quite interesting, Alex, that uh, so far at least um, there has been no comment from the uh, UK, from any UK political source. Yes, it is very interesting, Mike. I remember in my time uh, at GCHQ, which of course is a, a branch of uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, there would be at least a junior minister statement immediately by the MOD or FCO or both within the first two or three hours of such a serious thing as a flanker coming down. Uh, the silence is deafening, I think. And I was interested to hear you just say there that Dmitry Peskov, the presidential spokesman, says that we know very clearly, if I heard that right, that the aircraft was shot down over Syrian airspace. Uh, they are absolutely uh, saying that. The Turkish, of course, say that the uh, aircraft had uh, encroached into Turkish airspace and of course they've been saying that the Russians have been encroaching into Turkish airspace on various occasions over the last few months um, but uh, the Russians absolutely determined that uh, the aircraft was in Syrian airspace and they say that that can be independently verified. Well that is uh, a nice corroboration of how cautious the Russians are about things because uh, I did a search a couple of hours ago on what the Russian MOD was saying and in Nisavisamaya Gazeta, independent paper is the name of that newspaper, so it's independent of government, uh, the adverb that the Russian MOD was using this morning was that the uh, plane was probably or presumably, it's a difficult adverb to translate, but most likely over Syria. So you see that the Russian MOD's approach is to go on the facts they have at the time and build up in degrees of certainty. Uh, rather different from the bluster and, and PR that we're used to from Western State Departments and uh, Ministries of Defence these days. Well, I mean, what, what can be said for certain is that the aircraft crashed on the Syrian side of the border. So if it had encroached into, uh, Rush, into Turkish airspace, um, it certainly hadn't uh, encroached very far because uh, it, it, it came down fairly quickly once it was hit by the, uh, by the uh, missile. Um, so, uh, I mean... Uh, do you think this silence is a reflection of how seriously everybody recognises this situation to be? I think that it will be an imposed silence. I think that if there hadn't been a command going out from the top, possibly from number 10 this morning or the Elysee in the French case, I'm sure that um, there would have been a statement by now uh, because the PR machines in the defence and foreign ministries of both Britain and France would otherwise be itching to put something out preemptively. That's the way they do things these days. So I think that they've uh, perhaps done a double take, sharp intake of breath this morning. I noticed that the Daily Telegraph had the flash headline this morning, calm down, why the downing of a Russian fighter won't start World War Three," And uh, methinks the Telegraph doth protest too much. Uh, yeah, indeed. Now, just to give a little bit of background of this, of course, uh, Turkey vehemently anti-Assad. Uh, they have they were pretty upset when Russia um, decided to get itself involved in the uh, attack in the defeat of ISIS. Uh, and Erdogan said at the time, uh, the steps Russia is taking are quite unacceptable to Turkey. And he went on to say that Turkey's air sport, airspace is NATO's airspace. And I noticed that many commentators today um, are suggesting that. Uh, that this is an attempt by Turkey, uh, by Erdogan, to draw NATO into something that perhaps they would otherwise not want to be drawn into at this time, certainly. Um, so, 
you know, the question is why would Turkey uh, be so anti-Russian? And of course, uh, there have been many, many allegations over the last few months that Turkey has been uh, one of the nations uh, helping ISIS deal with some of the oil that it has access to and therefore directly funding ISIS as a result of that. Um, and But I think perhaps the other uh, potential reason uh, is the concern uh, among uh, with Turkey and certainly among some other NATO um, uh, nations, Britain being one of them, that, that France and Russia may uh, in fact pu pull together some kind of coalition to fight ISIS. Uh, and, uh, you know, t Turkey, along with Britain and the United States, see ISIS as being a key part of their attack on uh, or their, their moves for regime change in Syria. So I don't know what your views might be on that, Alex. The two elements you've covered there, Mike, the uh, cooperation with the French and the NATO angle are merely reflections of deep strategic thinking in Turkey. I used to live in a, the country that's between Turkey and Russia, which is Georgia. And uh, I took a keen interest in geopolitical events in all the region. Now, the Turks, by most calculations, have fought 18 wars against the Russians since the rise of Russia to a great power in the 18th century, starting with Catherine the Great. And they have lost 18 of those 18 wars. And that is the key fact that Turkish diplomats, let alone strategists, strategists are taught uh, in college. Don't provoke the Russians. Don't provoke the Russians. And if you do, make sure you have two or three Western great powers on your side. So, so is, what, is Erdogan just mad then? I th I think he's one of these deranged characters. Uh, he's he's alienated his votes. Uh, he has got people voting for him who shouldn't be Kurds. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the historical reality of the situation. Of course, you'd never expect the Kurds to vote for a man like Erdogan, an extreme Turkish nationalist. Uh, he's got people not voting for him who should. The secularist uh, mainstream of of, of Turkish uh, political life. Uh, those, for example, who've been alienated by his withdrawal of the alliance with Israel. So uh, I think that his actions are megalomaniac. And as with a lot of countries in that region, you only need to look at the new presidential palette built in the last few years to realize what's going on here. Don't forget, of course, that the southern underbelly of Russia, like the old Soviet Union, but now Russia itself, has a good 20 percent Turkic population, nations related to the Turks, with a mutually intelligible language and, of course, Islamic. And the Russians are not best pleased about Turkish interference in that underbelly. Uh, now, of course, uh, you mentioned Georgia a second ago, and uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, um, another Erdogan-esque uh, character, perhaps, because he's poked a stick at the Russian bear in his own time while he was president of Georgia. Um, but you were suggesting before the programme that if we were talking about uh, Turkey's um, movement of oil, ISIS oil, that uh, Saakashvili was involved in that game as well. Near Eastern geopolitics is a terribly complicated game, and I could, if I start on it, I'll, I'll be withering on all day, but I'll just reduce it to this rather bizarre fact. Uh, when Saakashvili's people got fed up with him and pushed him out in the same way as he pushed out Shevardnadze, uh, he was at a loose end for a while, and it was to be anticipated that the Russians would bring charges against him for war crimes against the Ossetians uh, as a result of the 2008 war. Now, what he did was he got himself an, a lecturership in New York because he, was, he thought he was immune from prosecution there. And before you knew it, the Ukrainian government, this is the Putsch government that uh, toppled uh, Yanukovych, had appointed Saakashvili, the ex-president of a foreign country, as the governor of Odessa region of Ukraine, which he still is. Now, Odessa is a very dirty money uh, place. It's, uh, it's got Transnistria behind it, which, which sells ex-Russian, ex-Soviet armaments. Uh, and Saakashvili has been implicated widely in the Russian and I think Turkish press now of selling ISIS oil. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, so um, appointing Saakashvili to that role in Ukraine has got to be just a, a dig, another dig at Russia? Yes, it shows how uh, some of these thinkers in a whole belt of countries in, in the zone between Russia and Europe uh, have had their heads turned. They're thinking post-nationally. A lot of them have been in New York. And if you follow the careers of these presidents and prime ministers before they shoot up to power, they haven't got a support base in their own country. They haven't been a traditional party figure in their own country. They've gone off to New York, in some cases the LSE or Paris, and they learn some ideas about how to defeat Russia and join in a happy band of European multination, multinationals. Uh, and that's how they enthuse their own people and come to power. And after a few years, the uh, bitter fruits are plucked and they uh, end up out on their ear. Yeah.
Um, well, um, just looking at the chat box here, um, when bef just as we were preparing to come in air, we still hadn't seen any official statement from uh, Putin, but I'm seeing people in the chat box uh, suggesting that uh, Putin's saying there would be serious repercussions uh, for what's happened today. So we'll, we shall watch this with interest. Uh, but of course, uh, um, events in Syria uh, continue. Um, and uh, Russia's Today reporting, and I've seen the video of this, it was, it was pretty uh, spectacular for those involved. Um, a, a number of cars filled with journalists, clearly marked as being press cars, attacked by, uh, by well, people unknown. Uh, it seems like an anti-tank an anti weapon used. Um, and uh, it landed right beside the car, turned the car over. Um, they ended up with some minor injuries, but nonetheless, a uh, pretty scary event and for them personally, but uh, never a good thing when the press is targeted in this way. Um, any comments? The Russians regard their journalists as an extension of the state enterprise much more than the Western countries do. And uh, having had a lot to do with the Russians in the past, and I'm thinking here of the downed pilots today as well, uh, a Western reader or viewer might be thinking, oh, there, there's going to be some explaining to do to those families. But uh, I'm not saying that the Russians are callous, it's uh, often a stereotype of them. But they simply have a different attitude, which is that they're all on, on board with the national projects. They all have to complete the mission. If some of them fall, then the rest will take revenge for them. So I fear that there's going to be very serious repercussions. If Putin says there will be serious trouble, he means it. He said in 2006, in terms, quote, if the West recognizes the independence of Kosovo, Russia will recognize the independence of the autonomous republics of Georgia. That's Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And nobody took him seriously, but he did it. Yes, indeed. OK, well, let, let's move on. Um, and of course, uh, uh, defence, uh, we covered this a bit yesterday, but you wanted to comment on some of the uh, European coverage of, of the uh, British reorientation of uh, de defence spending. It's another one of these uh, content light French articles, and uh, I've said the last couple of weeks, Les Echo is, is one of the better papers for content in France. Uh, but look at that key word there, which you can see even if people are not fluent in French. The United Kingdom is reorienting its yes. military spending. That is a way of exp uh, accepting that there is no increase on the cap on military spending. Uh, that's coming out of Her Majesty's Treasury, of course. Cameron would like to pretend he's sovereign over these things, but as we discussed last week, uh, spending is jealously guarded by Osborne and the civil servants under him. Uh, underneath the uh, main image there of a Dassault Rafale on the deck of the Charles de Gaulle, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by the way, it's a very worn deck, as Brian would be quick to point out, uh, underneath that is a bar chart uh, in which the French are crowing about the pole position they have in military spending in, in relative terms. Uh, you know that there's been a big to-do about the threshold of 2% of gross domestic product going to defence spending in Europe. An American general saying, well, if you don't do that, you're not credible and you're just taking a ride on the Americans. Um, we're still just above that at 2.1% in Britain. And the French, to, together with the Greeks, who have a, almost a war footing with the Turks, a fellow NATO member, strangely, the French and Greeks are at 2.2%. And this is apparently the big news for the French, is that they're marginally ahead of the UK. It's kind of jockeying rather sadly for position as being taken seriously as the main uh, ally of the Americans in Europe, which is a trend that uh, Patrick Hennison and others have been saying for some years. The French are keen to upstage Britain as the reliable strategic partner in, in, in Europe of the Americans, particularly for Near Eastern operations, because they have a lot of experience and projection there. Yes. OK, so um, tell us about this one then. Yes, another difficult one to translate what, uh, what the French word azimut means. Well, azimuth in English is, is a word, but what it's really saying is Paris is pulling out, pulling out all the stops, uh, that is diplomatically in its international relations, to respond to Islamic State. Now, do you recall what we discussed about the name of Islamic State in French last week, uh, that it was uh, usually called Daesh in yes. French? All of a sudden, it's l'état islamique in a headline. Uh, I don't think they listened to uh, UK column, the French government, but it seems that in the week since then, they have come round to the uh, the same hymn sheet as the Americans and British, which is that there is this thing called the Islamic State, uh, a sudden volte face. Is, is this an effort to give it a little bit more credibility or something? Yes, I think Hollande has been saying for two weeks or however long it is since the attacks now, 10 days, that uh, we're going to war. And if you're going to war, you need to define the enemy as a state, don't you? So I suspect that there really is going to be some serious French uh, firepower trained on whatever this thing is. 
Um, well, in the meantime, then, France is, uh, has announced that it is looking to uh, continue to subvert its constitution and any sense of uh, liberté. Uh, and uh, is uh, they're going to seek new powers to monitor, well, they're saying terror suspects' bank accounts. But of course, uh, I'm quite certain this power will not be limited to terror suspects at all, uh, but uh, in fact to uh, many uh, people that are simply um, questioning government policy and so on. Um, so France's finance ministry is seeking new authority to track bank accounts of people who um, who have uh, merely come under the suspicion of int by intelligence agencies as part of intrusive new plans to combat terror financing. Um, frankly, Alex, I think uh, there would be more uh, more uh, benefit to actually looking at the uh, money laundering activities of the uh, major banks rather than looking at individual bank accounts. Um, because, of course, uh, uh, if it wasn't for the money laundering uh, done by the major banks, um, terrorist organisations at any level uh, couldn't operate. I quite agree. And the, the big three of French banking used to be notorious for laundering African money from African peoples to dictators to Paris and Switzerland in the end. And British bankers used to be smug about that. But of course, we've done the same thing. Look at HSBC, which started with the Jardine Matheson opium running enterprise in Hong Kong. So I, th I think you're quite right. And uh, a thought occurs to me, if the French want to sink a couple of billion nominal euros from a, from a computerized account into some munitions, then they're going to need to raise some extra money from somewhere, aren't they? So it might be pretty handy if they can freeze bank accounts. Yes. Now, um, you're living in Holland, but of course you uh, spend quite a bit of time in Belgium. Uh, and uh, the uh, fallout from the Paris attacks continues. Um, so we've France 24 reporting here. The Belgian authority has, authorities have now charged a fourth suspect uh, with regard to the Paris attacks. Um, but, uh, well, I, I chose Haaretz because this is the one that was forwarded to me, but this is being covered by other media outlets as well, uh, that... Four have been charged, uh, but 16 have been arrested in Brussels raids. Uh, but it fascinated me uh, that the Paris attacker is still at large because, of course, you've got to have your bogeyman. This looks to me like an exact copy of the Boston Marathon scenario. Um, do you recall what happened with the uh, Chechen brothers Yes. after the Boston Marathon? Uh, there needed to be what the American police are now calling a shelter in place, in other words, an illegal un unconstitutional curfew uh, imposed with men waving guns and tasering people, uh, while these dangerous suspects were rounded up. And then the next unsurprising thing in Boston, and now I think again in Paris and Brussels, is that there's going to be one extra bogeyman. He's usually been spotted in CCTV, but unknown to the intelligence agencies. And in order to round him up, we need to terrorize an entire district, carry out a, a complete playbook of, of new counterterrorism techniques. And then all of a sudden, he's found with his body riddled with bullets. Uh, in the case of the Chechen in, in Boston, I think it took, uh, first of all, uh, it, it, well, the, the, the situation was uh, kind of about face because he was, first of all, shown to the cameras being walked along, wasn't he, by the police. And all of a sudden, he, his, his body was riddled with bullets. Yes, indeed. And of course, he was found in the, in the middle of the woods in a, in a, a, a log cabin. So... So that's probably why they couldn't find him on CCTV. Um, but you, uh, you also wanted to highlight, uh, sorry, you wanted to highlight this article. Uh, now, the big black rectangle is a video. We're going to show a couple of still stills from this. Um, but you wanted to make the point about how easy it is to manipulate um, the news and, and also to make the point that Belgian news outlets are happy to let people know that this is the case. Yes, this is quite a serious Belgian uh, news outlet. It's one of the titles uh, of the Flemish state broadcaster, VRT, if I understand it rightly. At least the, uh, the video that's shown is, is produced by VRT and embedded into this page. And the headline there says, Brussels Today, a photograph shows how he can manipulate truth or the reality of the situation. And it's a very normal guy. There he is uh, with his long lens camera saying, uh, to, to a camera crew. It's a kind of background piece produced for an evening news programme on, on the equivalent of BBC News. He's saying, look, if my orders are to uh, show a bustling teeming street, uh, use a concertina shot on the side of the street where the shops are open. And then you'll see that you'll show that in a moment, what the result is. There we are. Thank you. And that's the right-hand image uh, of a particular shopping street. 
and you can see that everyone, the full length of the street, looks as if they're almost cheek by jowl. And then he stops over, steps over to the, the opposite side of the street, uh, directly opposite where he was standing, and says, look, the shops are not yet open on this side of the street, so if I stand here and use a different softer focus and a, and a, and a, a, a different zoom, then I can make it look like a ghost town with tumbleweed. Yes. And he did that again uh, with a with a a street heading down to to I'm not sure that's what that the, what that building is at the end there. I believe that's Belgian Parliament. It's a side street of the uh, Rue de la Loi, uh, the street of the law, which is the street between uh, Brussels Central and the European Union quarter. And the point is that there are people there, but if you get out early enough, uh, you can make it look very threatening. I was due to be in Belgium yesterday and again this evening, and I've cancelled that uh, because I had to problems with my wife's health, but uh, I would have been able to get there perfectly well on the train, so I've double-checked, and uh, my friends in Belgium are saying, certainly outside Brussels, it's business as usual, the trains are running, people are being offered refunds if they had a long-distance journey, uh, but everything's running fine, so I wouldn't believe everything you read in the British press, including from British correspondents based in Brussels, I think we're coming on to that now. Uh, well, indeed, you're absolutely right, and of course, uh, you know this this isn't anything new either, because uh, it was the same in their coverage of events in Northern Ireland. A lot of the time, we had people, uh, friends of the family in other countries, um, you know, phoning asking, "Are we all right?" From time to time, when in fact it was just business as usual. I've had an example of that myself as a teenager twenty years ago. I, I was going to mention Northern Ireland. I was staying on the, in the youth hostel in Londonderry. Uh, which, as you may, might know, is on the west side of their walls. It's kind of holy ground for the apprentice boys. And there's this one gate in the walls through which you can uh, come up through the Boggan and the, Craig's, uh, the, the, the Craigan and the Bogside into the historic city centre to protest. And there were these Sinn Féin marshals channeling them all up, and they were even throwing a few Molotov cocktails. Uh, but the whole thing was playing out within a field of view of maybe 20 degrees. And I was thinking to myself, even as a teenager, well, if I had a camera, I would sell this as a footage of Londonderry rioting. But yeah. if I... And to read right or left, people will be going up the street as normal. Yes. Um, right, inside the uh, ant trade, how Europe's terrorists get their weapons. Weapons black market is served by the army of underworld uh, foot soldiers who smuggle arsenals bit by bit. Now, this is really, you're really wanting to discuss the Schengen Agreement here. Yes, the key paragraph in this, which is the usual uh, British broadsheets approach of uh, isn't the continent a simply awful place, says this, quote, it is, however, a different story on the continent. It's, it's contrasting the situation with Manchester gun running. It's a different situation on the continent where, thanks to the borderless Schengen zone, that's a, a trick, a wordplay already, those involved in the ant trade, what they mean by that is that there's lots of small players instead of a Mr. Big, face little more than a long-distance commute to and from their supply sources in the ex-communist countries of Eastern Europe. For a start, uh, most of the countries being mentioned as sources of the weapons are not in Schengen. Uh, Macedonia isn't even in the EU, for example, which they go on at length about how awful that people have guns in that country. Now, we know why they have guns in their country anyway, because uh, it's their only defence against being uh, uh, taken a pot shot at in the next coup or, or uh, ethnic war in that area, stoked by the West. Uh, but the, I read the, the, the article's nonsense, even between the Netherlands and Belgium, and that, that's an even closer zone than Schengen, that's Benelux, it's uh, for many purposes a single country. Uh, you will find the Dutch gendarme, the Koninklijke Marie-Chaussee, will get on the train uh, between the Belgian and Dutch border stations and say, passports please. And sometimes, sometimes people ask, hey, I thought we had a borderless agreement, and the police will say, no, no, it's uh, simply a matter of convenience, we reserve the right to check you at any time. Last year, the Danes temporarily suspended Schengen because they had problems with, I think it was Hell's Angels coming over the German border. And there was no talk then of Schengen being dead. Uh, but uh, look at the next slide that you've got ready for us here. Matthew oh, yeah. Oldhouse, I'm not sure he's based in Brussels, but uh, in any case, he's a Telegraph correspondent. Uh, the Telegraph made his uh, tweet, uh, which you can see on screen, the tweet of the day yesterday. Passport control on cross-border trains from Brussels, Schengen in trouble. Well, I've just told you that's a lot of nonsense. And that isn't me there. That's my namesake, the senior Channel 4 news correspondent who's been on the box for, for years now, isn't he? Alex Thompson. Um, and that's the original treat that Hull House of the Telegraph was forwarding, saying, look at this barriers at queues for high street train level. But that, that's, that's been there at various times during the existence of Schengen. Uh, I, I go through that station quite a lot. Uh, the extent of the barriers might be new, but the, the right is reserved by treaty to do this. 
Uh, yes, and indeed, um, uh, a couple of years ago, Brian and I drove down to uh, Barcelona to visit uh, somebody in prison there. Um, and uh, uh, the crossing, the border crossing between France and Spain, um, it was completely closed. Well, it wasn't closed because they were allowing traffic through, but, but the gates were closed. You had to be checked. Um, the place was uh, uh, covered in uh, militarised police with, with uh, full facial coverings, balaclavas and so on. Um, so, you know, this, this is something which uh, various borders um, have had from time to time uh, in Europe and uh, it, it does seem to be being hyped a little at the moment. I think so. And uh, to go back to the Northern Irish equivalent, of course, the British Isles agreed after the Irish Republic, or the Free State as it then was, split from the Crown, that there would be a common travel agreement, the CTA, which still exists, which is why you don't have to take your passports, uh, certainly on the ferry to Dublin. I'm not sure about the flights these days. Uh, until 20 years ago, you didn't even need to show your passports on a flight to, to Dublin. Uh, but if you recall, at the height of the Troubles, there were areas uh, on the border, South Armagh, um, uh, West Fermanagh, where there were country lanes that were ideal rat runs for the Provos. And most of the time, the soldiers on both sides of the border sealed those lanes off almost permanently. It didn't mean that there was a, a border check in operation uh, as a regime between the two countries. It was simply a security measure. Uh, indeed. OK, let's move on. Uh, number of news outlets reporting today this wonderful news that uh, the government for some reason they have announced this a day before the uh, the uh, the spending review which is tomorrow um, so why they've done that nobody really knows uh, but the NHS is to get an above inflation uh, 3.8 billion pound cash boost next year apparently and uh, well isn't that brilliant Let's just remind ourselves of the reality of the situation. The NHS has to find £22 billion of savings uh, over the next period of time, but that's okay because they're getting a £3.8 billion cash boost, so that's good. Uh, so what's that, about uh, 2 to 3% rise? Um, but at the same time, the NHS has got, what, a 40% rise in demand? Um, so that's good as well. So I'm not really sure, Alex, how this actually is a positive uh, situation. Well, having been out of the country for six years now, I'm uh, at a loss to understand NHS financing, if I ever understood it. All I know is that on the continent, we have a series of uh, publicly funded, government regulated health insurers that seem to do a jolly good job at a fraction of the price and never seem to be in a cash crisis. Well, indeed, uh, I think it may be uh, something to do with the uh the common purpose influence, but if anybody wants to find out a bit more about that, they can have a look at uh, the various articles on the UK Column website. Um, okay, now uh, you wanted to, to cover this. Now, the background to this, I suppose, is to do with uh, the idea of nation states and whether and and groupings within nation states, and of course, uh, uh, whether uh, nation states are being held together or split apart at the moment. So. Uh, give us a bit of background to this, because this gentleman's to do with the with the Flemish uh, grouping within Belgium, is that right? Yes. Uh, the talking head you can see there is uh, the, the journalist whose name appears above his head, Ivan Olivier. And he is, uh, under the caption underneath rather pompously says, he is a British expert, among other things. And he accompanied Bart de Wever, who is the leader of what you might call the moderate Flemish Nationalist Party, the NVA, on a trip to London. And Mr. Olivier shows just how much of an expert he is on Britain by breathlessly describing how Bart de Wever is cordially received in Westminster and shown up to the first floor of Downing Street, number 10 Downing Street. Oh, unprecedented. And he turns it into a cynical piece about uh, this supposedly artificial friendship between de Wever and David Cameron. Now, we have to suspend disbelief here about how the Belgians regard Cameron. The, more, the point is that it shows something about Belgium as a nation falling apart if it was ever held together. Because the point is that the, this uh, commentariat figure, this elite journalist, says, well, Mr. De Weber must be uh, clutching at straws. He must be uh, forging a cynical friendship. Because, after all, De Weber wants to split up Belgium and Cameron is a unionist. So he hasn't really understood Cameron's position for starters. Uh, and he doesn't, hasn't understood how these blocks in the European Parliament work because the Conservatives are no longer in the, the major centre-right grouping. They're in this uh, uh, European Conservatives grouping together with the Flemish party. Now, it might all be a bit complicated, but uh, this, this will probably bring it to a head. The initial version of that article didn't describe 
Cameron as the friend of de Riva. It described him as his buddy instead of friend in Dutch. It was saying friendje, which is like his little mate. And it took one Flemish commentator under the article, reader, uh, so commenter, I should say, uh, to point out that this was enough to indicate the, uh, the point of the article. Uh, and then they silently changed it to his friend Cameron instead of his buddy, uh, which is all the way of saying that the Flemish have had enough of being told that they can't possibly regard themselves as a nation. And they're no longer cowed by these elite journalists saying anyone who forges uh, a Flemish political union with, with anything else it must be an extreme nationalist and a hypocrite. The Flemish aren't standing for that anymore. Um, and you wanted to highlight this book. Yes, uh, A Throne in Brussels, it's called. It's by a Flemish journalist written in very good English. By The, the chap's name is Paul Bellin. If you type A Throne in Brussels into Amazon or any other uh, bookseller, you'll find it. Um, he describes painstakingly, reign by reign, since the beginning of the Belgian crown, which I'm sad to say that the Britain created out of nothing when Belgium split off the Netherlands. Um, every king, and they were cousins of Queen Victoria, by the way, the saxe coburgs uh, every king tried to turn Belgium into a nation and failed. And the thesis of the book, it's very readable, even if you haven't got much historical background, uh, is that Belgium is a deliberate, cynical, post-national jelly, and the EU is being recreated in the image of Belgium. Yes, well, I think that's, uh, I think that's absolutely right. Okay. Uh, now, of course, all this other stuff that's going on in Syria, the Middle East, and so on, uh, and even uh, in Europe with regard to terrorism and, and ISIL and so on, is, has pushed the, uh, the notion of child sexual abuse right onto the uh, back burner. And of course, we're hearing absolutely nothing, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, from the, uh, the CSA inquiry. Um, we've been suggesting here at the UK column that there has been a move to normalize child sexual abuse um, for quite a number of t years, and this is starting to accelerate, um, and uh, with the aim of really make, giving the impression that actually nothing really serious has happened here because it's quite normal for this, for some proportion of the population to have this sexual orientation. It's not that serious. And of course, it's the BBC that is left to really push this story. Now, admittedly, this particular report um, has, uh, has appeared in a number of other news outlets that thousands of child sexual abuse cases are missed. Uh, and the implication here is that this is such so endemic within the British population that you know you can't single out any particular uh, section of the community. You really couldn't uh, suggest that a politician was um, you know, doing anything terribly wrong because this is, this is going on right across uh, the country. Um, but an article which isn't, or at least I didn't see in too many of the other media outlets around the country uh, and published at the same time is uh, this excuse for paedophil paedophilic activity. Are paedophiles' brains wired differently? It's just a medical problem. And really, uh, BBC pushing this aspect, this uh, idea really hard that uh, paedophilia is perfectly normal. It, it's something that happens in a proportion of society and uh, really um, probably we shouldn't think too badly of uh, the implication is at least that we shouldn't think too badly of politicians who fall into that uh, category. What are your thoughts on this? I'll come at it from a Dutch angle again. Uh, the Dutch have, as usual, been a bit more obvious and upfront about the policies that uh, academics and ministers are pursuing behind closed doors in Britain. And there was a whole period of perhaps 30 years from the mid 60s onwards where Dutch criminologists were real uh, wild child types, flower power, and uh, they were arguing that society made criminals, paedophilia was just another sexuality, um, criminality was of any kind was caused by the circumstances in which you grew up. And uh, for a while they actually emptied the prisons. The Dutch are still closing prisons, by the way. Uh, but I'm afraid the people in the end get fed up with it, because however liberal you want to be seen as, there comes a point where your rhetoric, if you're one of these types, uh, comes up against the fact that you want your own children to grow up safely. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, uh, moving on again then. Uh, <laughs> this I found absolutely fascinating, uh, this story. But it's been talked about in, in the media for a number of weeks now uh, that the Vatican is uh, has bringing charges and actually is, is uh, putting various people, three or four people on trial uh, for leaking 
documents, leaking Vatican documents. Now, this relates to uh, the butler um, of the previous pope, um, who, if you remember, leaked documents and a book was published. Uh, and so they eventually tracked down uh, the uh, people that had contributed to that book. Uh, and uh, uh, they are have established a Vatican court uh, to prosecute two journalists and uh, two members of Vatican staff. Now, uh, it's understood that the journalists are very likely to very unlikely to turn up to that because of course it's a Vatican court and they may not feel that they need to submit to its jurisdiction um, but then nonetheless um, it is interesting that the Vatican is more concerned about who leaked the documents uh, than over the allegations uh, that were contained in those leaked documents Alex Yes, uh, the Vatican City is an odd beast and uh, really a kind of resurrection of medieval polity in, in modern Europe. I was astonished to read that these guys have been summoned to a papal tribunal. Leave aside for a moment that it was Italian journalists, because they certainly don't reside in the Vatican City. They might live a stone's throw away in Rome, but they're not subjects of the Vatican or the Pope. Imagine if it had been British journalists who'd got a leak from a, a papal butler. Um, and they suddenly got a summons at their home address in Britain from a papal tribunal. What kind of uh, effect would that give? And while we're at it, although, uh, like you, I place no faith in international organisations, I have to say that the treaty framework is, is worrying. Uh, the Vatican City is not in the EU. It's not a member of the UN. It's not a signatory to any of these wonderful human rights declarations that have been uh, created out of thin air in the last few decades. So in theory, if you do turn up to a papal tribunal, they can incarcerate you for life, torture you and kill you without any breach of international law. Uh, well, uh, that, that may be true. They've got to get you first. And, but certainly the, the, um, on BBC Radio 4 this morning, they had the, uh, the PR man for the Vatican uh, uh, discussing this issue. And uh, he was really, um, I have to say, John Humphreys being as patronising as ever, perhaps, uh, um, perhaps justifiably in this case, but, uh, but the, the, the message that was being sent clearly was that, uh, that the two Vatican employees were, were going to end up at the tribunal because they are Vatican employees, but, but the likelihood of the journalists turning up was very slim. But nonetheless, um, the other excuse that they were making was that uh, uh, basically the, what, what, the, what Pope Francis was aiming for here was, was some loyalty um, and the stopping of this leaking of information because he's trying to reform uh, the Vatican Bank and the fin Vatican's financial situation. Well, we wait with bated breath to see what he actually does. But in the meantime, they're clearly still uh, relatively embarrassed about the, the leaks rather than the uh, actual offences in the first place. Yes, uh, there's there's been a very cynical attitude on, on the part of cardinals going back a good generation now to cover up the, the Vatican's dirty money trail. Uh, you might remember Roberto Calvi, the banker, found... Uh, hanged under Blackfriars Bridge in, was it 1980 or even 79, 78? Uh, the, the Bank for the Operation of the Faith, I think it's called, is the, the Vatican Bank since then. Uh, a lot of stuff has come out. A lot of people have woken up to the truth movement or whatever you want to call it through the angle of looking at the Vatican and the Jesuits. Yes. Um, you can easily run away with conspiracy theories. I mean, I grew up, as I suspect you did, in a, in a, uh, a God-fearing Protestant household and it wasn't forced down my throat, but uh, I grew up with the assumption that uh, the Pope is one of the main incarnations of Antichrist. Whether you believe it or not, it is uh, hard to justify what the churchmen of the Vatican do uh, to cover up their trails now. Uh, yes, indeed. OK, well, um, apparently we're not allowed to have baths. This is the King of Sweden trying to save his skin. And he's the third senior male royal, or the third senior king, I should say, of a European continental household, uh, royal household, who has been exposed as a, as a sex scandal type recently. The Belgian king and the Spanish king both had to abdicate. The continental model is, is that you no longer reign until you die, that you hand over to the, the middle generation when you get old. The Spanish and Belgian kings have had to do so, but the Swedish king with his sex scandals is still in office, which is, just goes to show that nominal Catholicism is usually more moral than nominal Protestantism. Now, here he is uh, trying to save his skin by becoming a, a saviour and a, a saint of the Green Movement and asked in an interview what he would do uh, beyond his own palace to save the world or save the planet or whatever you want to call it. He said, we should ban all baths. Imagine that. Chuckle, chuckle. I don't think he's uh, joking. Uh, not in a country like Sweden, which is the most uh, 
well, I'm, I'm going to use the, 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 the hackneyed worse. It's, it is a fascist and a Nazi country in Europe. So, uh, so which is more ridiculous, the idea that Syria, the Syrian situation is caused by uh, global warming or uh, the, f the suggestion that we uh, can solve uh, the alleged global warming problem by not having a bath? Well, the link between the two is religious feelings, isn't it? Um, you, you've got a post-Christian continent. Um, politicians are quick. We've seen it with the Lord's Prayer scandal this week. Uh, to claim that there is some religious morality to the country, even when there patently isn't. But people's spiritual feelings aren't going to go away. And in the very comfortably off countries of Northern Europe, where they don't even have that Catholic morality of Southern Europe, um, they're going to turn anything they can into a religion. And it seems to me that sinning against Mother Earth is now the, uh, the heinous sin. And if you can take a stand against it, you have a chance of being canonized and having your sexual foibles forgiven you. Uh, well, maybe not. Okay, tell, tell us about this one then, finally. This is a couple of weeks old, but it's a longer term article about what's going on on the continent. Uh, the headline is, Se anche sedicenni, uh, sorry, yeah, sedicenni votassero in Italia. If even 16-year-olds were able to vote in Italy, and that's a cartoon of 16-year-olds on the way to the ballot box. Italy hasn't done this yet, but as you can see underneath um, the article, uh, Austria has at a federal level, uh, allow 16 year olds to vote and some of the German lender the federal states of Germany have and uh, you can see that and of course sorry of course uh, the House of Lords has just uh, has just voted for that themselves so that is on the agenda with regard to the European referendum in this country as well I had missed that one what a comforting thought 16 year olds of various nationalities voting on the, the future of a thousand year old uh, sovereign state called Britain of which history, they know no history but that, that troubling thought aside uh, there's reference to Scotland as well with the Scottish referendum in this uh, article. The, the, the startling thing about this is, demo, uh, is demographics, and you might have a closing comment about this, uh, because they consult this uh, usual thing, the, the political scientist expert, in this case a guy called Ilvo Diamanti, and uh, he is quoted as saying 70% of Italians under 25 think that they need to go abroad to have a professional future. They have no idea what future awaits this country. And when they seek help, they know jolly well it will be the family, not the state, providing it. Unlike here in Italy, in the rest of Europe, you do have to grow up at some point. Now, I'm not suggesting that Italian young people are more immature or selfish than anywhere else, but the shock about this was the demographic discovery that only 2.2% of the Italian population is 16 or 17 years old, which is unsustainable demographically. And when you've got, when you've got too few young people to tip the balance, uh, then you have a situation where, as the article itself says, the young people are intrapolati dal welfare di nonni. So they're, they're entrapped by their grandparents' welfare. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is not only a European problem, of course. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know whether you've been following the situation in China where they're trying to re-encourage people to have babies and they're failing miserably to do so because uh, they don't have enough people uh, of the right age of the right with the right health in order to, in order to do so and of course the the lives that they've built for themselves are so uh, based on uh, stupid working hours that they basically don't have time for it anymore um, and uh, right across Europe we're seeing the demographics being changed to the point where where nation states are unsustainable and of course that is part and parcel of the agenda because if you have a sustainable nation state there's no reason to for, for the uh, institutions to be replaced with something else. So this is a problem being created right around the world um, with the intention of uh, uh, destroying the nation state and replacing it with, well, what? It, yes. It's kind yes. of a rhetorical question, Alex, but, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's clear that at every level, the nation, you know, the notion of, the notion that David Cameron is a unionist, as you were su suggesting earlier, or somebody was suggesting in, in one of the articles earlier, it, it's, it's so ridiculous when, when every, every uh, institution is being broken up uh, and uh, devolved and nation, the nation being destroyed. It's happening at every level. Um... Plato was the first uh, to go into print, or well, there was no print then, but to, to write a book on uh, how the nation state is a jolly bad idea and we should be ruled by philosopher kings instead. And all the things you, t you see in China with the forced breeding and then the forced stopping of breeding are all ideas that come straight out of Plato's Republic 2,500 years ago. Um, but I, mentioned, I noticed that you mentioned uh, the breaking up from the, the lower level as well of nation states. 
Now, one of the things that will be in the headlines probably tomorrow, because it's been uh, in the Belgian headlines today, is the uh, mayor of Brussels, as he's quoted as being, saying we can't go on living under this state of siege. We need to open our shops and businesses again and have fun and, and be families and, and go out for dinner, and which shows the disconnect between uh, a real politician like a mayor and a national politician who's never done a day's real work in their life. But here's a closing question for you, Mike. He's described as the mayor of Brussels. How many mayors are there in Brussels, actually? Well, uh, the European Union has two presidents, so I would imagine Brussels must have five mayors, perhaps. There are 19 mayors. Ah. In <laughs> OK, OK, well, five okay. Five is a bit low. So uh, why is that then? Every municipality within the city, uh, equivalent of a London borough, has its own language situation and uh, it has uh, its own identity. And it's been given uh, for, as a kind of sop to the local politicians. Uh, a a councillor uh, who's been a hack all their lives in politics is given the, uh, the booby prize title of mayor. So you end up with 19 people with a chain of office around their necks on, in, in one city claiming to speak for the people. Now, isn't that a very effective way of breaking up a nation state or even a city? Uh, well, you couldn't do better. OK, well, look, on that note, uh, we'll leave it for today. Uh, thanks very much to you, Alex, for joining us. And thank you very much uh, to everyone who's watched. Uh, we'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, well, let's keep an eye on what's going on in Syria. Uh, and uh, we'll leave it at that for now. OK, thank you. Bye bye.